Thank you for the introduction, Mario. Um, so we already hear a couple of times in this meeting that brain comprises only 2% of our body mass, and yet it consumes 20% of our energy. While it really doesn't have the energy storage where it could keep the fuel for when it's needed. So to answer the question, how does this really function and how does the brain regulate its blood supply? A lot of research has been looking at neurovascular units, which is a sort of a conceptual model between anatomical and metabolic interactions between neural cells, uh, vascular components and glial cells in the brain. And one of the main functions of this unit is so-called neurovascular coupling, which has a main role in blood supply regulation. And we also know that oh, this is really spoiling the content. <laughs> We also know that uh, this uh, phenomenon works like that, uh, that CBF is uh, increasing or cerebral blood flow is increasing around the neurons that are actively firing. So it can, in this way, support the energy demanded by these neurons. And we also know that disturbances at this level are in the basis of major brain diseases. Um, however, if we want to study neuro neurovascular coupling in humans, we are quite limited. Um, mainly because the techniques that could be used in this per for this purpose are invasive and destructive. So what we commonly do is we rely on uh, rodent models. Um, and from these kind of models and these measure more invasive measurements, we know that microvessels do play a key role in blood supply regulation. And moreover, the topology and geometry of cortical vasculature um, really determines the spatial and temporal features of the hemodynamic response. And what, what is more interesting is that these are altered in rodent disease models. But if we want to talk about translation of knowledge between rodents and humans, this is quite problematic, mainly due to um, anatomical differences between the species. And we frequently mentioned that, for example, the artery to vein ratio is three to one for humans and completely inverse for rodents. And another limiting factor is the anesthesia that is commonly used in the rodent experiments, and it has a uh, confounding of effects on uh, on uh, hem uh, on the hemodynamic response. Is this a good sign or a bad sign? <laughs> okay. So if we pass again to human side, what can we do? Uh, so the most commonly used technique uh, to map the brain activity is bold fMRI, and it's actually triggered by the neurovascular coupling. But what is problematic here is that we really don't know what falls in inside this bold mix. And we know that it's dependent by hemodynamic changes caused by neurovascular coupling, but as well the architecture of the vessels and then, for example, vessel density. Another limiting factor in studying uh, neurovascular unit in humans or generally for MRI um, was something that you run already touched upon, and that is the resolution. And uh, here I'm showing you the image of electron microscopy of vascular corrosion cast. Just for you to have an impression, if we even have one millimeter isotropic voxel, we are still missing quite a lot of things, and especially the capillaries that we are interested in in this case. So what do we want to do um, in this project uh, is we, we propose to use computational modeling for the purpose of better understanding the relation of all fMRI measurements to underlying cortical vessels anatomy, but also the spatial temporal features of the hemodynamic response. And what is really important here is that our models needs to be, uh, needs to, need to be enough realistic because of the reasons that I mentioned before, right? Uh, the bold signal depends on the architecture of vessels. So to tackle this, uh, we have developed a pipeline that uses a graph theory uh, to extract realistic vasculature models. Uh, from the mouse cortex based on two photon microscopy data. And using these realistic models, we want to simulate hemodynamic changes caused by vasodilatation. And here I will show you the pipeline uh, for doing this, and I will walk you slowly through all of the steps. So we are starting with raw data, and uh, of course the first challenge is to segment the vessels or to binarize the data. And, uh, here I'm showing you just one example of automatic versus manual segmentation. Of course, manual one is not fun. It takes a lot of time. 
So we are trying to do it sufficiently good for our purpose. And what I want to stress out in these images that you can really see the size of the model that we are working with. So we are really looking inside one one of this one one voxel of MRI. Let's see, let's say, and still there is a lot of details inside. The next step after you have the binarized data, uh, you would skeletonize the vessels. Uh, skeletonization uh, it means uh, using medial axis thinning algorithms which will shed the vessels until only the central line or the skeleton is remaining. And then when you have this in hand, you can identify all the branching and ending points of the vessels, and then use that information to divide the skeleton into vessel segments and label them. Uh, and then you can compute a range of properties with which you can characterize the anatomy of the vascular network. And here I'm showing the results for radius, length, tortuosity, and here displayed the angle with the respect to the axis uh, normal to the cortical surface. Then the next step would be really the core of this uh, of this pipeline, and that is creating the vascular graph. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we want to represent a vascular network as a graph. But what, what does that really mean? So we plan to use graph theory here. Uh, and uh, this is a very powerful tool uh, which gives us possibility to simplify and quantify complex systems by converting them to networks of nodes and links. And if you are not familiar with this concept, maybe it's a bit hard to grasp. So I like to put it in more comfortable for everybody example, and that is Google Maps. Uh, so if we want to convert this map into a graph, the streets will become the links and then the intersection of the streets will become the nodes. And actually, every time that you put an address to Google Maps, you are using one of the graph theory algorithms to find the shortest path between point A and point B. But how does that really apply to our vasculature? So we want really to make a roadmap of our vessels. And uh, how we start with that is uh, that vessel branching and ending points are becoming the nodes of the graph and vessel segments are becoming the links. And uh, then you know how all, all of the system is connected. Uh, but the one thing that it's still a bit tricky and you don't know about it, it's you start if you started with a binarized data, then how do you know which vessel is which, which is artery, which is vein? So I have been also working a lot on trying to find a semi-automatic way of labeling the vessels. And here I'm displaying displaying uh, just the comparison of semi-automatic and manual one. Uh, of course, veins are in blue, arteries are in red, and capillaries are in this pinkish color. And then um, the very last step is uh, converting the graph into a connectivity matrix. Connectivity matrix is, is uh, just a binary sparse symmetric matrix. It is of size n by n, where n is the total number of nodes in the network. And if any uh, nodes i and j, let's say, are connected, the entry of the connectivity matrix at that place is 1, and also at the symmetric inverse couple. So the connectivity matrix gives us really a possibility to convert the connectivity of a very complicated networks, such as that one on the left, into a just binary uh, two-dimensional matrix of zeros and ones. And how it's usually displayed is by this sparsity pattern, where x and y axis you see the nodes number, and all of these small dots inside are representing like each dot is one connection. And you can see this pattern is. Uh, uh, concentrated around the main diagonal and that brings the notion that uh, nodes that are in close proximity to each other are connected, more often connected with each other. And then why are we doing all of this and why the connectivity matrix and all of this story um, is, as I mentioned in the introduction, we want to do some hemodynamic simulations. And uh, we do that by converting our connectivity matrix into our resistance matrix. And each one of these vessels in the graph is converted to a resistor. And then we can compute the resistance of each vascular segment based on the properties that we computed before, such as radius and length, and also viscosity. And we impose here as an inlet to our system uh, blood pressure, uh, oscillating blood pressure, which is resembling a heart rate of, uh, of mouse. And then at the outlet, we are setting, choosing two veins for the outlet and setting them at constant pressure value. And then we can really model the fluid flow through this network, um, through this network of resistant resistors, which is caused by pressure gradients in the in the network. And what we also wanted to see is how our network responds to 
fuzzy dilatation. So we know some basic concepts. Obviously, the radius uh, in dilated vessels is increasing, and that is leading for resistance decrease. Flow on volume are increasing, and uh, this all together leads to increased transport of oxygen and nutrients. And here are some of our first results. I'm not sure. Ah, there we go. So this is the dilation that we simulate. So it's a 50% increase of radius at, and it has peak at five seconds. That is a bit exaggerated just to see the change uh, in, the, in this visualization on the left. Um, here is the simulated blood pressure, which resembles a, a heart rate. Um, and then we can see um, in these graphs below the aggregate changes across the whole network in uh, blood flow, blood volume, and in resistance. And we can also look at this in a more spatial distribution way, like is displayed on the left. So you will notice at one moment that the vessels will light up in yellow, which is corresponding to this dilation. And then you can also see the persisting flickering pattern, which is resembling this uh, oscillating blood pressure. And uh, just to summarize this talk, uh, we presented here a pipeline which offers a very flexible approach for extracting realistic vascular models by converting them into a mathematical graph representation, or how we call it here, a vascular graph. And uh, we hope that this approach uh, will help in investigating how the vessel architecture and the spatial temporal features of hemodynamic response affect the bolt signal but also it will be a tool for simulating different vascular conditions. Um, but of course, there is still a very long way to go. Um, in future, we plan to uh, implement the oxygen transport and also more localized activation, so more localized uh, dilation. And that will be it for today. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, thanks to my supervisors and our sponsors. Do you have any questions?